Welcome back to my series examining Missing 411, Western United States and Canada by the author David Polites. Today we'll be looking at the Oregon chapter of the book. Let's just dive right in. Robert Bobo, who was 36 years old at the time, went missing on Friday, October 2nd, 1998 from Union Creek, Oregon. On the day of the 2nd, Robert was dropped off in Woodruff Meadows near the Union Creek Resort by a friend. His intention was to go hunting the following morning, since that was the first day of the hunting season. He set up camp and got ready for the next day. The following morning, a friend of Robert's came up to the camp, but they couldn't find him. A quick search of the campsite revealed that all of his clothes and firearms were still at the camp, and his signature hat that he always wore was laying on the ground. According to his family, he would not have gone anywhere without that hat. The last time Robert was seen was at 9 p.m. It was dark at that time, making the idea that he had left in search of another campsite dubious at best. It seems as if some sort of disturbance or violence took place, causing Robert to either leave against his will or otherwise be taken. In review, I wasn't able to find anything wrong with this particular case. Uh, there is obviously some speculation in there about the disturbance or violence taking place. There was no clear evidence of that from anything that I saw. Uh, however, he isn't there and he still hasn't been found uh, as of recording this video. So credit where credit's due. It looks correct so far. I will publish another video if I ever do hear back from the sheriff. Samuel Bulk, who was eight years old at the time, went missing on Saturday, October 14th, 2006, from Crater Lake National Park, Oregon. Samuel was on a father-son weekend trip at the time of his disappearance. He was on the spectrum for autism, and his father, Kenneth, was looking forward to having some bonding time with his son. They rented a cabin at Diamond Lake, and they spent the first night of their trip there. The next day, they headed to Crater Lake. They entered through the northern entrance of the park before going around the lake to the Crater Lake Lodge for lunch and a card game. They left the lodge and ended up near Cleetwood Cove around 4 p.m. The two went across the road to look at the scenery when Samuel took off ahead of his father. This wasn't unusual since he liked to have his father chase him as a game. Kenneth obliged, but lost sight of his son as Samuel went over a small hill. When Kenneth arrived where Samuel had disappeared, he was met with a heavily wooded area with no sign of Samuel. Kenneth searched and called out for Samuel, but he couldn't find him anywhere. He tried to call 911 on his cell phone, but there was no reception. Desperate, he returned to the road and flagged down cars to get help. Within 30 minutes, the first park official was on site and called for additional help. As the search got into full swing, the area was hit by a storm that made searching difficult. Even so, they carried on, and the efforts continued for the next month without any results. According to search and rescue documents, there was an estimated 88% chance of success based on their efforts. In total, there had been two helicopters, 200 searchers, bloodhounds, and numerous interagency involvement, which all totaled a cost of over half a million dollars. The only evidence that all of this searching turned up were footprints of a young person with a small stride on October 20th but this never led anywhere. Search dogs seemed not to want to cross the area where Samuel had disappeared. According to reports, the NPS and FBI determined that there was no evidence that Samuel was the victim of a crime. I don't have much more information, but I do have some, despite my Freedom of Information Act being ignored. 
When Samuel went missing, it started out a little bit different than how it's reported in Missing 411. After spending some time on the slope near the lake, it had already started to get dark. Kenneth walked back to the car, but Samuel stayed on the slope. As Kenneth started to approach Samuel, he says that he thinks that Samuel took this as the start of a game of chase, and he took off running. Kenneth said that he was never closer than 50 feet to him since he was unable to catch up. This is where it again converges with the story in the book, where he loses sight of him over a hill and then he was gone. But more important than the minutia around the reasons why Samuel went missing is the exact details of the search that his autism affected. Samuel's autism took the form of a fear of lights and loud noises. This meant that searchers could not use the usual whistles and horns to guide him out of the woods, which obviously made things far more difficult. If I ever do hear back, like with these other cases, I will make another video with any additional findings. Charles McCuller, who was 19 years old at the time, went missing on Thursday, October 14th, 1976, from Crater Lake National Park. I know we aren't in the review section yet, but right away we have two contradicting statements from Pilates. I'll read them verbatim so you know there's no trickery on my part. You can find them yourself with all the context on page 60 and 61 of the book. First, quote, the official response from Cheris Wilson of the NPS in Denver states that they have lost all records related to this incident, close quote. The immediate next sentence is, quote, they claim that the park did not have space to maintain these files, so they were destroyed, close quote. Well, if that's the case, then the records were not lost. They were not misplaced. They were destroyed because according to Pilates himself, they did not have space to maintain a solved case from the 70s. But I'm getting ahead of myself, so let's just continue with the claims without too much further scrutiny. On January 29th, 1975, Charles traveled to Crater Lake to photograph the park in winter weather. He told a friend that he would return before the 31st and to call the police if he had not. On February 1st, his friend made good on his promise and called the police. The NPS and the state police distributed missing person flyers throughout the area. A logger reported to the police that he had given Charles a ride to the park entrance on the 30th. It wasn't until the 10th of February that the family was notified that Charles was missing. It's hard to understand why this would be the case. It's important to know that, at this time, the weather was very snowy. The depths of the snow at Crater Lake were between 20 inches and 90 inches, with snowdrifts standing at a staggering 20 feet. More snow fell throughout the time that Charles was missing. When Charles had disappeared, his father was very concerned about it. He sent a series of letters to the FBI requesting their help. He was convinced that Charles had been abducted, but the FBI refused to get involved. Charles' father then contacted his local congressman for help. He went to the area several times to search for his son himself. Letters that are part of the Freedom of Information Act request indicate that he was very frustrated with law enforcement, but was pleased with the efforts of the NPS. During his first trip to the park, Charles' father left a list of items to be on the lookout for that Charles had with him in his backpack. This turned out to be a very smart move, since later on, the next year in October, a very identifiable item would be found. A group of hikers were well off the normal trails in the west side of the park when they found a backpack and a scarf. Obviously, unattended gear is unusual, so they searched the backpack and went on to report the finding to the office at Crater Lake. Among the items retrieved was an unusual Volkswagen car key that the officer recognized as being on the list of items that Charles would have had with him. Hikers drew a map of the area where they had found the backpack, and they had the foresight to hang clothing from nearby trees to make the area easier to find. The site was bowl-shaped, with a creek flowing through the middle of it. A large fallen tree crossed the area. 
As they searched, NPS officers found a pair of pants that had been obscured by the large tree. The officer describes it as, quote, if you were standing straight up and melted straight down into your pants, that is what it looked like, close quote. What also struck him as unusual is that the belt buckle and pants snap was undone. Alarmingly, when the officer reached down to examine the pants, a bone was in the right leg of the pants. It was broken with blood on either side. Examining the rest of the area, they located some elastic from underwear, but no other clothing was found besides socks with small bones in them, but no boots. They expanded the search, and about five feet away, they found a skull and a jawbone. Bone fragments were also scattered all around. Two things that were never located were a special folding knife and Charles' camera. Both of these were things that he was known to have with him at the time. The NPS officer said in an interview later with Polites that he could not understand what had happened to Charles' boots. They were heavier than the pants, so they should have still been there if the pants were. He also thought it was very unusual that the pants and belt buckle would have been undone. He had never seen a case where bears would have consumed the body on the scene, and normally they would have taken a piece of the body with them away from the area to eat later. The FBI said that Charles had died of natural causes. What remains a mystery is how he would have walked from the north entrance of the park about 14 miles to where his body was found, especially given the snowfall and lack of preparedness for a snow hike. First, I'd like to address the obvious mistake. Charles did not go missing in October of 76. He went missing in February of 75. I know that Politis knows this since it says as much in the body of the case, but the header does not follow the usual rule that every other case has so far and lists the time of his remains being found instead of the time when he went missing. It's just an odd deviation from the usual format. I've been made aware that this case is sometimes referred to in the community as the case of the melted man, due to the description of how the pants were laid out. I want to emphasize now that the bone fragments alone obviously disprove the so-called theory here and now. I normally disregard the theories outside of how the book is written, but I can see how there could be some confusion based on the importance that Pilates puts on the description of the pants. A more accurate way of saying it would be that it was as if his pants were pulled down. Just like that, there's no longer a mystery. I'm sure that you've seen pants in this configuration before without you having melted out of them. And to clarify, I'm not claiming that he pulled his own pants down. I'm just saying that if your pants were to be pulled down, that's how they would be left on the floor. To me, this just reads as the NPS official attempting to describe how the pants were laid out in a descriptive way, not because he believed that Charles had literally melted. With that rather painfully obvious point out of the way, let's look at the rest of the case. We're going to go a little bit out of order here due to how the information is presented in the letters available from the Freedom of Information Act request. As such, you may notice that on screen, there's only the points that I plan on disputing rather than the whole thing. According to an individual that I believe is Charles's father, the name and relation has been redacted in the documents, but that's what makes the most sense. Charles was prepared for the snowy weather, both in terms of gear and knowledge. Quote, he had knowledge of snow, survival techniques, and his equipment was very good, close quote. His father went on to say that he had the equipment and knowledge to make snowshoes if he had to. Also, he acknowledges that it's possible that he had hiked far, and possibly even off the trail, if the snow was sufficiently cleared or frozen over. It sounds like his father did not think it was out of the question for Charles to travel in the snow. He went on to acknowledge that the four inches of snow that had fallen since his initial arrival in the park would not have posed a big problem. The feeling of Charles' father regarding the foul play must have been involved seems to have stemmed not from evidence, but from the inability of searches to locate him. Quote, 
After returning home and reviewing the information contained in police reports that we possess, plus maps of the areas searched and the intensity of these searches, without finding any signs of equipment, we concluded that Charles was not the victim of foul weather, but rather a victim of foul play." Close quote. I do agree that, given the documents from his perspective, the police did not do a good job here. I also agree with the sentiment that it is possible that a crime was committed and that the avenue was not properly investigated by law enforcement. It definitely wasn't handled well, and I don't want to make it sound like Charles' father was out of line here. He was not. The police dropped the ball on this one, but it sounds like it may not have done much good had they investigated anyway, knowing what we know now. And what do we know now? Well, we know much more than what is listed in the book. The skull was not the only evidence that law enforcement had on what happened to Charles. It is true that the pathologist determined that there were only weather marks on the skull, but there's more. I shall quote a document from the Freedom of Information Act directly. Please excuse the redactions. Quote, On October 19th, 1976, S.A. redacted, together with redacted, the deceased redacted, park rangers and officials from the OSP crime lab were flown by helicopter to the location near Bybee Creek, where McCullough's remains had been found. This remote, rugged, mountainous area was searched as thoroughly as practical for any clues as to how McCullough may have died. The theory advanced by park rangers, and the one most plausible, is that McCullough became lost in the snow while trying to hike from the north entrance of the park to park headquarters. With 100 inches of snow on the ground, Bybee Creek would most probably have been completely covered with snow. McCullough probably was crossing the creek on top of the snow and fell into a crevice where he perished. When the snow melted in the spring, redacted. The spot where McCullough's body decomposed was located and examined by state crime lab examiners. Their examination located quantities of decomposing hair and clothing, and several small bones. It is the opinion of OSP redacted crime lab examiner that McCuller died at the same spot from exposure to the elements and was most likely trapped in a snow crevice at the time. No indication whatsoever a foul play was located." Close quote. Now what's really interesting about this is that the records seem to indicate that while he was at the scene, Charles's father was actually convinced that his son did indeed die from exposure. If I'm reading between the redactions accurately, he stated that he would contact the FBI to remove the missing person's notice. However, he ended up going back to the foul play theory and went on contacting representatives and law enforcement to this effect. Now before we call this case closed, I want to briefly talk about the idea that a bear would have moved the remains. To this I say, sure, maybe, but that does not preclude other scavengers and carnivores such as wolves and mountain lions from consuming the remains. Crater Lake doesn't have a native wolf population, but they are known to pass through the park from time to time. There are, I believe, mountain lions there who also could have fed on the body as well as other animals. Also, since things such as his shoes were missing, well, then that makes it entirely possible that the pieces of the body were taken and cached elsewhere. This is speculation on my part, but if his hiking shoes were mostly leather, then it would make sense that an animal may take it elsewhere for later. I'm also curious as to what the alternative could possibly be. Why does it matter that the shoes are missing at all? I'd like to know what you think in the comments below. What do missing shoes say about this case at all? Once again, I'd like to thank my patrons over at patreon.com for their very generous support that allows me to continue making these videos. In particular, I'd like to thank those of the public recognition tier which include the anonymous user, you know who you are, thank you, as well as Nigel B. So thank you patrons and thank you for watching.
Until next time, take care.